Hi, everybody. How are you? How lucky am I tonight? This is, uh, this is kind of a fabulous opportunity. Ms. Lang, how are you? Welcome to Chicago. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is so exciting. Um, your, in your interest in photography seems to have begun when your uh, then husband, Sam Shepard, the late Sam Shepard, who I've been thinking about because I actually did uh, a program with Sam Shepard at this very festival a number of years ago. Um, but somewhere in the 1990s, he gives you a camera, a Leica N6, I think it is? M6. M6. So, and all of a sudden, this sparks this very long career now in photography you've had. And I guess I'd like to ask, what was it about a Leica M6 that, because you think of a camera as just a camera, and yet, are they really that cool that you were able to sort of <laughs> do that? Well, uh, I mean, my interest in photography um, actually uh, predated, predated the that. gift yeah. um, from Sam. Um, when I was... Uh, when I was at the University of Minnesota as a, as a freshman, I met a group of photographers and um, quit school and went off to live in Europe with them while they were making a film on... Uh, there was some, there it was, was some much hot, more interesting, let me tell you. There were some hot guys in that class. <laughs> yeah, there really were. <laughs> um, <laughs> And we traveled to southern Spain, and we, they were uh, making a documentary on the flamenco gypsies and the whole, uh, that world uh, that existed down there in Centennial and um, Peron de la Frontera. And, uh, so uh, that was my first, and they were all young, budding photographers. So that was my first interest in photography, but it was more just as an observer. And then we all moved back to New York City and became involved with Robert Frank and Danny Lyon and some of the Seminole photographers of that era. Um, so I knew always about the power of photography. Then a couple decades later, I started collecting and I surrounded myself with great photographer's work. And um, so that when Sam gave me the camera and to address the Leica M6 <laughs> mystique, um, it is the finest, I mean, it is one of the finest, maybe the finest camera, um, I think. And I, I suddenly was, uh, I, I, yeah, I had this amazing, you know, gift, and I thought, well, I have to do something with this. So he I just showed up with it one day. And he <laughs> yeah. Said, yeah. Well, he knew I was, you know, because I had talked a lot about photography, and I had um, started collecting photography. And um, so when the when the, when I got the camera, I thought, well, all right, now I have to do this seriously. So I built a dark room and started processing my own film and printing and taking the camera with me everywhere I went. And that became, that was the beginning. That was kind of how it all started, where I was actually serious about photography. So for the first many decades of your career, you were more photograph than ph photographing. Certainly. So, <laughs> I always think of, and, and obviously you were a very, well, were, are a very, very famous person. And generally speaking, most famous people dislike being photographed. It, it's invasive to them. I'm guessing it was invasive to you, especially at certain periods when you were up for two Academy Awards in the same year and all the rest of it. And it was must have been a real sort of invasive period where people were coming out, you know, paparazzi were hanging around. So, did you learn anything from being photographed in terms of becoming a photographer? 
Well, the, you know, I was never interested in that kind of, um, I mean, my interest in photography was always through it just, I remember Mary Ellen Mark, who, a great photographer, who looked at my work one time and said, I would describe your approach as a fly on a wall. Um, I never like to intrude on the moment, uh, the person, the situation. So I, I would try to be as anonymous as possible when I was, when I was on the street taking photographs or whatever. Um, which is the opposite of what a paparazzi does, who's <laughs> like in your face in the most intrusive, um, personal way possible. So, uh, and I think in some strange way, the, the photography was a wonderful counterpoint to uh, acting, in that, you know, an actor is like, constantly surrounded by people. Your work is dependent on mm -hmm. crews and, and other actors, director. I mean, there's, it's not a private, it's not like being a writer or being a painter. Um, you don't have control over time and space and all of that. You're, you're really involved in a communal effort. What I found with photography was it was just the most personal and intimate and private thing, um, and I loved that about it because, like I said, it was it was it was the absolute counterpoint, kind of to to my life as an actor, and I could just wander around by myself, almost like in a state, you know, a, a meditative state, and just do it privately. It was one, it, and it was a yeah. I I I found that I. I really actually needed that at some point in my life. But I mean, didn't some of the people you were photographing suddenly look at you and go, oh, wait a minute, this is Jessica Lange who's... <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't think they did. I just, um, no, I mean, I, I, people were well, like with this last project, a lot of the people I um, was photographing were people who were the only other people out on the street. Many of them were homeless people. This is during the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it was um, a unique experience because, and I would never, I would never point my camera at somebody uh, unless I, I don't know how to. Um, there was a long time where I didn't, I photographed people with, but I didn't want them to know that I was there or that I was photographing them. So there was no direct contact. But at a certain point, when I was doing my previous book, Highway 61, I loved the idea of the direct contact and that thing of um, the, the, the kind of call and response in a way yeah. uh, that transcends time so that you look at a photograph decades later and that person is like, you feel connected to them because they're looking directly at you. But I never did that without first getting their permission and saying, especially like with, with the homeless people on the street because it's such it, it, it's such a fraught situation, and I never wanted them to think that I was there just kind of, you know, recording the, their situation. So I would always talk to them, and I would always ask, would it be all right if I photographed you? Would it be all right if I took your picture? And no one ever said no, so... Really? It, yeah, it was, I really felt... Uh, fortunate and gifted that I, you know, had that opportunity. I had this, uh, th this revelation once. I was uh, in a, a Broadway theater and I was, I was in the men's room and I realized that I was peeing next to um, Billy Crystal, in fact. <laughs> and, I remember, and, and I remember that his eyes were focused 
uh, on you know, his own business. And I remember thinking to myself uh, that this is the price of celebrity a bit, that you don't, most, uh, even celebrities who are very, very nice to people often have so much interaction with people that they don't seek out more of it mm -hmm. from the general public. So in other words, they go through life trying to contain on some levels interaction. I, I, I don't mean that to be critical, I mean just to survive and to yeah. not get caught up with too many people with all these things they want to tell you and all scripts they want to give you and all the rest of it. What you've been doing is this sort of the opposite of that, where you've been going up to strangers essentially and saying, may I take your photograph? It, it's a strange um, juxtaposition in your life, it seems. So you must want to seek out more human contact on some level. Yes, and definitely that was the case when, uh, during the pandemic, because when the lockdown happened, and it happened so uh, dramatically and so abruptly, New York just kind of emptied out. Yeah. Anybody who could leave, left. Um, if they had, you know, the opportunity, the choice, the ability to. And what was left was a New York that I hadn't seen for decades and decades and decades. And it was just like the, the it was a whole different uh, kind of um, energy suddenly on the streets. And it really was about survival and it was about, um, it was about absence and it was about loneliness and when I would encounter these people, I mean, it was, it was an exchange that was very heartfelt on both of our parts because sometimes they would be the only people I would speak to during the course of the day, except, you know, on the telephone or whatever. But most of my friends were gone. My family wasn't there. Um, so it really, everything, and everything had shut down, so it wasn't even like you were having a you know, casual exchange with a waiter or a, a right. cab driver or anything. It was, and I found that they, uh, and, and also the fact that normally in New York when you're moving around the city, and I'm sure it's the same here, everybody is with a purpose and nobody, and everybody is distracted in a way. You know, they're either looking at their phone or they're thinking about where they're going or they're in conversation with somebody. So there isn't the opportunity to just slow way down and observe who's around you and who, who is like available. Um, but during that time, which was this extraordinary kind of moment in, <laughs> in the city, you had all the time in the world because there was nothing to do and you weren't going anywhere and there were no appointments and you had no destination, which was part of this practice of derive. So when I would like, um, when I would see somebody and make eye contact with them, I could tell that their impulse was the same as mine, which was to have some kind of connection. And oftentimes I would stop and we would talk for half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe more. And, I, you know, it was, it was a unique experience. And I really thought of it as a gift. I mean, you wouldn't have been able to do that 30 years. Would you have wanted to do that? In, along t in, oh. in the 90s, or, or is this is something that you are happier doing now than you would have been there? I probably would am happier doing it now because, mm. I mean, I have found with age that my life empties out somewhat, mm. you know? Mm. My children are grown, yeah. um, my husband is gone, um, mm -hmm. You know, the career is like somehow. <laughs> it's not so bad. <laughs> In kind of a stall. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, you know, you just don't have the opportunity to work as much as you used to. So, uh, uh, yeah, you're, you, 
But again, I think of it more as, instead of some kind of burden, I think of it more as a gift because it's allowed me to do things that I yeah. wouldn't normally do or have time to do or interest in. So obviously this is not, you, you've done many, many books of photography, uh, 50 photographs in Mexico, unseen, and then the Highway 61 piece you just mentioned, going back, I think, to 2008. So there's a many, many of these collections of photographs, but this new one then, so what you did is you got up in the morning, this. De, am I saying it right? De Reeve? Is that right? Something like that. De Reeve. De Reeve. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you have no purpose, but you still have the Leica, presumably, the same Leica. Well, one. okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the way it started was um, I was in New York. It was the fall. Which fall is this? 21? The fall of 20. Uh, oh, 20. Mm -hmm. 2020. Mm. And... Um, I mentioned to my son, I don't know, what am I going to do, you know? I mean, I had gone to my cabin, which I always do in northern Minnesota for the summer, and come back. And then the idea of being in New York, and I mean, at that moment, everything was closed down. There was no yeah. theater, there were no movies, there mm. was, the restaurants were closed, um, you know, s grocery stores. They would let you in, like if there weren't too many people in there. I mean, this it was it was strange, and what wasn't open um, had been boarded up, so it had this strange kind of otherworldly yeah. you know, Armageddon feeling to it. Yeah, it did. Um, the streets were empty. There was very little traffic. Pedestrians had disappeared. And I said to my son, I don't know what I'm going to do here through the fall and winter and spring. I mean, it's going to... And he said, uh, do you know there's practice of derive, the theory of derive, which I had never heard of, um, and it based on or d the work of uh, this mid-century French philosopher Guy Debord. And he explained it to me a little bit. And I looked into it, um, and it was it was interesting because I thought, oh, okay, this is something I can try. It, I mean, basically, what he's saying is that you leave your house with no purpose in mind. I mean, it is really just, um, just. I mean, I guess the closest translation to derive would be to drift. And with no expectations, you let go of all your usual reasons for going out and going, uh, moving about. And you just allow yourself to be drawn, and he says, usually in an urban terrain, by the attractions and the encounters that you have there. So I started doing that several times a week for like, I gave myself six months. And I would walk out the front door and just randomly decide, do I go right, do I go left, do I go uptown, do I go downtown, do I go east, do I go west, with no, no preconceived idea of what I was going to do that day. And you just kind of start to wander. And you're just wandering, kind of being drawn by like, oh, I've never seen that before, and you start down that block. Or, uh, and I found some days I'd walk as many as 10 miles. Oh, wow. Um, Ten miles? That's a long one. That is a lot, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I did that for a few days, and then I thought, you know what, I'm going to start carrying my camera with me because I really want to have some... It was never with a purpose in mind. It wasn't like, I want to do a book about this, or I want to... It was really just as a visual diary because what I was seeing was so fascinating in this rather unnatural way. So I started walking and with the camera. And, and again, it wasn't like, for instance, when I shot Highway 61, I was deliberately going out looking for photographs because I had this, this theme in mind. This Highway 61, remind me where that is. That goes from? It goes from the Canadian border in northern Minnesota. Right. 
and ends in New Orleans. And you went the entire... Oh, many times, yeah, wow. many times. What, what was the source of your fascination with New Orleans? I've always loved New Orleans, always loved New Orleans. And then um, uh, we filmed there for two seasons of American Horror Story. Uh, and I decided finally that it was someplace that I wanted to live. So mm -hmm. I, sta I was there for about five years. Mm -hmm. And then, like everything else in my life, one day I woke up and I thought, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> sold the house and left. So <laughs> but there, so with that book, you were driving and then, so what were you doing? You were stopping the car when you saw something interesting. Yes, yeah. yes. But I was purposely, <laughs> purposefully looking for things. Yeah, to add to this collection. So give us an example of some of the things you saw on, on that, on that route. Um, well, I remember once driving through, uh, because Highway 61 is a very uh, interesting route. It comes down through northern Minnesota, which is the part that I knew very, very well. And then um, makes it way, it, a lot of times it's running along the Mississippi River. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Delta. Um, but I remember one time driving through the little town of Osceola, Arkansas, and saw a man sitting in a window of an abandoned um, building. So I drove past, I drove past again, I drove past again, and finally he <laughs> waved at me. <laughs> <laughs> so I parked the car, and I got out, and I talked to him for a while, and and uh, again asked, would you mind if I photographed you? No, no, he was very, you know, obliging. Um, so that kind of thing where, you, you know, you would see a person or you would see a building. One of the things that fascinated me about that whole stretch, and I feel very strongly about having driven north and south, east and west many times, many, many times, is that there's a pervasive sense of loneliness, I think, in this country. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it mm -hmm. is what's gone missing, you know, like the small towns, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. downtowns, you know, first they, were, first they were abandoned, you know, in favor of the strip malls on the outskirts of town. Now even the strip malls mm -hmm. are abandoned. And mm -hmm. I, it's, you know, so that, that, that's always interested me a lot. And Highway 61, I mean, I'm sure like if you drove Route 66, I mean, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. historic mm -hmm. highway, not just because of Dylan, but you know, <laughs> I mean. You're not really one for sitting in Beverly Hills and collecting awards and, I mean, you could be doing that. I wouldn't mind collecting awards. I'm not going to sit. In, <laughs> not going to sit in Beverly Hills. Though. <laughs> but you have remained tethered more than most of your peers to the Midwest, right? I mean, that's a yeah. Fun. I mean, I've 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 always kept a uh, cabin up in northern Minnesota. This is a plush cabin, or it's a rough and rustic. <laughs> Is a Hollywood cabin or it's a real cabin? Well, it's definitely not a Hollywood <laughs> cabin, but it's also not something, you know, I don't have to go out and pump water. <laughs> I would hope not. I would hope not. I would hope not. So the shoots that you do, are there, uh, are you out of the car, were you on the, the Route 61, are, are you out of the car, click, and you're back, or are you taking an hour or two with these, to make these photographs? You mean on Highway 61 yeah, when I was doing yeah. that? Or in general, yeah. Well, no, I mean, you know, a lot of times um, they would happen really quickly. You'd see something, you would take the photograph, and you'd be on your way. But in New Orleans, I lived there, so I used to wander around that city all the time mm -hmm. with my camera. Um, in northern Minnesota, because you know, that's where I'm from. Um, I would go to these places that I would remember or, you know, that I felt a connection to. And, um, but mostly it's, it's really, yeah, just in, that, in the case of 
like, or when I would shoot down in Mexico, it was always with the purpose of finding a photograph, you know, of like wandering with your camera and trying to find something, having the patience to, to find, a, find the photograph. With Derive, it wasn't that. It was really, I, I wasn't thinking in terms of, oh, that, that's an interesting photograph. I was thinking in terms of, I just want a record of this time and not necessarily thinking, is this a good photograph? Is this a, you know, vital photograph, whatever. It was just as a kind of visual diary of this extraordinary and unnatural time in New York City. And you don't crop your photo, you, you don't run something through some digital magic afterwards, you just simply, the photo is the photo, is that right? Yeah, I've always, because, <laughs> Because one of my favorite photographers, and I don't mean this to sound like, you know, pompous, um, <laughs> is Cartier-Bresson. He always, he always included the negative line in his prints so that you knew he was pr printing full frame. He was never cropping. Mm. And that was just a, a, conceit, a conceit that I um, tried to imitate. So it's a sort of, for you, it's a legitimate, it's the, the honest, full yeah. picture yeah. sort of thing. It's what you saw, what the camera recorded, what you saw through the, through the viewfinder. You know, it's interesting, you know, as you know, we have the, uh, Vivian Meyer, who is a famous Chicago street photographer. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, probably people in this room, we, I mean, I think about this sometime, that'd be a great, what a great photo that would be, maybe some detail um, as you drive down Clark Street. So what's, how do you do it? Like, what's your advice? What makes, you walk out there with your camera, your Leica camera, and <laughs> you have, um, what makes a good shot? How do you, what do you do? Well, I mean, I think that's, you know, I, I look at, like, the great photographers, and I, I'm, Believe me, that I am not in any way um, consider myself in that. I mean, I don't. So anyhow, that goes without. Well, so stipulate. So st I mean, you're no. pretty good. So. But <laughs> but what I what I notice when I look at their photographs is that, and you can see, you can tell when something happens in an instant, and when they have like composed it. In other words, like with Cartier-Bresson, you know, there's a moment, that famous photograph of the man, you know, jumping the puddle. Well, I mean, the fact that he was there at that moment, camera ready, and caught him kind of mid-flight is just a miracle. I mean, I, but I think you, you know, the main thing is, is that you have to be, and this is, this is what I think it has in common with acting, is that it forces you to be present, that you absolutely have to be present in the moment to know what the truth is and to be available to it. Um, so in that way, the disciplines have been beneficial because they've, they, they've made me practice that. I always think of acting um, as uh, that actors are not so much playing characters as playing characters in motion, that we're always, always, everything's moving in the world, and great actors like yourself are, often have a kind of a kinetic quality where you're just constantly, many of your famous characters, some of which I was watching today, um, are always in constant motion, and yet here you are with an art form that's about capturing stillness, really. In a, and I'm, I was sort of curious about that because they're very different. They're sort of different things in some ways. Yeah, I don't know. Um. Like you look at those scenes with Jack Nicholson, that they're just sort of crazy scenes, crazy motion all the time, for example. Yeah. They are so far removed from you walking down the street in stillness 
seeing a solitary figure right. and shooting. Right, yeah. And it's all the same artist, you. Yeah, but it is in, I mean, just what I was saying before, there is a discipline, you know, it is that thing of, um, of being, being in that moment always, mm. so that one is, you know, obviously, ultimately the observed, and the other is the observer. And I, they've, they, they somehow lend themselves to one another. Mm. I think actors probably have a deeper understanding of human emotion than regular people. You do? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> I mean, they're more empathetic, generally. They understand, because that's what they do. Well, yeah, you, you, you get to make believe a lot. Yeah, you get to, I mean, you get to, I mean, that is one of the things you can explore, like, you know, the worst of human nature and the, you know, the most difficult wells of emotion. And, um, and then, yeah, go home at night and hold your kids and watch TV. And I mean, you know, I mean th that part of it, I mean, I, I, think, I think one of the reasons actually I was drawn to acting is because it does allow you to, to explore things that um, hopefully you can avoid in real life. <laughs> I mean, the characters that I've always been drawn to, like Frances Farmer or Blanche Dubois or Mary Tyrone, I mean, I wouldn't want any of their lives. Um, but <laughs> to pretend to actually, you know, delve into that and fall down those wells has been, I, I mean, it's been a wonderful gift. I always think one of, you know, your work in Tootsie was, I mean, one of your great performances, and yet you were sort of the only person in that film who was not funny. I mean, you were, <laughs> you were. <laughs> I'm never funny, I'm never funny. <laughs> And I was thinking, how did that work out like that? I mean, that's a sort I of, know. it's a really, it's an, it's an enigma, that role in that movie. Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, because I had just finished shooting Francis, which just about killed me. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. And um, I'd worked with the great Kim Stanley. Mm. Um, and she, she gave me this advice when we finished shooting. She said, do a comedy next. And I thought, oh, Jesus. And I'm not interested in comedy. First of all, I can't do comedy because I'm not funny. So, I mean, why would I do? And then Sidney Pollack just started pursuing me about that part. And finally, I, you know, flashed back on Kim's advice and I thought, all right. So that's how that all came about. But no, I'm not funny in it. And everybody else is incredibly, incredibly funny. Incredibly funny. Yeah. But the presence of you not being funny is what makes that movie work, really. I was sitting with my two granddaughters when they were really young, and um, <laughs> I, I was, we were watching TV, and I was going through the channels, and there was Tootsie. And I thought, I'm not going to say anything to <laughs> and, and we're watching it, and we're watching it. And I'm waiting for them to say, ma'am, that's you. <laughs> and, oh, you know, because I mean, I, I was at my prime. I looked <laughs> great. And, you know, um, and finally, after watching it for quite a while, I said to the kids, I said, that's me. <laughs> and it was a scene with me and Dustin. And Dustin's in drag and that horrible wig and that crazy, I mean, like, <laughs> voice and everything and they looked at it and they turned to me and they said which one <laughs> you're pretty funny that's pretty funny that is pretty funny <laughs> that's very good very so, dryly that put delivered me in my place yeah <laughs> well how do they i mean they deal with this it's this, it must be strange for them to see you when you're in these movies. It must be. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, your kids have grown up watching you, and then right. now the next generation, your grandchildren are watching you, and yeah, I, I don't think they're that interested in it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. I don't think so. <laughs> well, what I thought we'd do for a minute is let's look at a few of the photos oh, uh, yeah. that are in this. Uh, shall we do that? Right. So I'm going to try and work the remote. <laughs> Okay, so why don't we, we can see them in front of us, oh, so yeah. why don't okay. we, so these are, just to, just to, let's just remind everybody, so these are, this is the latest, the latest collection, the Derive, and it's, these are all shot in the fall of 2020. Well, th I gave myself six months okay. um, to do this practice, and in a sense, it's kind of like a walking meditation, because, you know, you're just being drawn by things. And Debord also talks about um, psychogeography, how... About what, I'm sorry? About psychogeography, okay. about how certain, like, areas, certain zones have an energy and um, a kind of a magnetic pull or repel, um, I guess, the same way. Um, and uh, it was interesting because I would find that, like, you know, my emotional response to certain neighborhoods and places I hadn't walked ever in all the decades that I've lived in New York um, would affect me emotionally. Like, sometimes I'd be, like, just, like, oh, i got to get out of here. Or, and sometimes I would just be suddenly, like, filled th with this kind of, I don't know, it was almost like um, a joy just being here in this area. Um, but what I did was, as I walked, if I saw something like, for instance, this photograph, I would take one, one frame of it, and that was all. Because, like I said, I wasn't interested in, in doing a, a book or anything like that. I just wanted a diary, a visual diary of what the city looked and felt like at this time. So I gave myself six months to do these walks, these random wanderings. And in the beginning, I didn't carry my camera, then I started to. So all of the photographs in this book, and I think there are 49 of them, are just moments that I captured as I was walking by. Nothing was, nothing was set up, nothing was anticipated. Um, so that's and Where that are we, the what, what is that? That's right on the Hudson River, on one of the piers. Mm. And this is what New York really looked like at the time. There might mm. be one person. Yeah. And you know, now if you took a walk down the Hudson River on the piers, there would be hundreds and hundreds of people. So, it was mostly sad to you. Is that a fair statement? Sad? Most sad that, that New York in this state, and, no. I, I, and I was there a bit myself, so I, I saw some of it, but you saw it as affirmative or sad or? No, you know? I mean, certainly I felt the absence, um, but, uh, and the lonesomeness, uh, the loneliness. But no, I didn't find it sad for the most part. I mean, certain areas would give, make me feel bad, but uh, no, not sad. I, I actually, I found it fascinating and I found it like, um, I, I don't even know how to describe it, but I was, I felt fortunate that I was there to observe it and to get this sense of what the city felt like in this state of absence. Why did you shoot from behind here? Well, this man fascinated me because um, there was just, again, and I think a lot of it is in this book, there is that sense of solitude or loneliness. Now, this is 
later in the year where there are, m m you can see that there are more people back on the street, but mm -hmm. there was just something so lonely about him as he walked down the street and the texture of his coat. And I mean, I just, I don't know, I just started to, when I was walking behind him, yeah, I just picked, you know, put my camera up and, and took that photograph. This, uh, yeah, again, walking down, I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the <laughs> that t tiny little old woman sitting there on the steps by herself caught my eye first. And then to see the storefront that she's sitting next to, I just found kind of wonderfully human and, and uh, sad and funny at the same time, so. Was it, did you, did you stay on the island of Manhattan or did you venture into boroughs? In no, places? I went to, I, just to Brooklyn because it was easy for me to cross the bridges and, and wander through the streets of Brooklyn. This was Brooklyn, actually. After you cross over the bridge, um, there's that whole kind of uh, riverfront area. Yeah. And yeah, again, you know, an empty, closed carousel, which normally would be full of kids and people and moving and... Did you always think it would come back when you were doing this? Were you thinking this is a temp I, I'm documenting a temporary state, or did you worry about permanent change in New York City? Well, I think the city has changed in a way, but certainly not, I, I, I never suspected or expected that it would stay like this during that first, you know, the, the first wave of the lockdown. But I don't, yeah, there's, there's something not quite back to normal with the city, and I'm not sure what it well, is. It's true here too. Yeah, it's true here too. yeah, you can mm -hmm. feel it. There's something off still, and I don't know exactly what that is, but um, maybe it's for the better. I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's. Well, not. you know, I I sometimes think that the we don't really know the context of the pandemic yet. And so there'll be future humanities festivals that will be about what did the pandemic do to us and yeah. what does it mean and how are we gonna be now? And yet we, this is kind of a first draft almost what you were doing, right? Yeah, I mean. yeah. It was the first wave of the lockdown. Mm. Mm -hmm. And there again, you know, Central Park, the fountain, nobody around. There's mm -hmm. just that one man playing his guitar by himself uh, under the arches. Mm -hmm. This is later in that period of time, toward the end of that six month, and you, you could feel a little energy coming back, but I just love these people. This was right in Washington Square Park, and they were there was something so wonderfully tender about this. They were renewing their vows, I found out. I thought it was a wedding, but it no. It looks like a wedding, yeah. <laughs> They were renewing their vows. I asked somebody who was there, and that's what was explained to me, yeah. What about the technical aspects of what you do? Like, how you frame those two shots that we're looking at there? Because it, you know, you make it look easy, but it's not easy to come up with shots like that. So what, what are some of the things that you know, for anybody who might want to do it. What are some of the things that you look for in composition and elements like that? Well, I don't, I, I don't really know. I think, you know, just like acting, it's instinct. It's um, y your eye just, and you move your camera to accommodate like what it is you're seeing. Um, but I think it, I, I really do. I think it's instinct more than anything that you can learn or plan or. And it's an emotional connection. Yeah, always an emotional connection. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, you know, these photographs of the city and um, Sam Shepard, who you were married to, 
I always think of as sort of the, the poet of wide open spaces in many ways. He was a sort of a, that, you know, sort yeah. of openness. And um, it's, it's funny to think, imagine the two of you together. It must have been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, our histories were, uh, we came from such different places. I mean, he was from like, you know, Duarte, California in the yeah. desert and the, you know, Central Valley. And I was from the woods of Minnesota. I mean, I, I do know that he, he, uh, he was never terribly comfortable in the deep woods. So, that's <laughs> for, <laughs> not having an eye on the horizon. Now, I remember when he came here, he, drove, he didn't fly, he drove. I mean, he would drive yeah. everywhere, right? He drove everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, one of the, I mean, the, you know, New York, because it was so empty, it was easy to get, like, these kind of um, reflections without, you know, things being in the way, so... That again, you know, is the kind of thing that just catches your eye. And um. you, you learn a lot from. I mean, you work with some great movie directors, and yeah. I think I read somewhere that you would, you know, when you work with Fosse, that you, I think you said once that you learned precision from him because he was such a precise artist, and then all these other directors. It must have. As an, act, as an actor and as a photographer, the influence of those directors, which really were the greats of the 20th century in Hollywood, that must have rubbed off on you. I'm just curious about some of the directors that you work with. Well, yeah, I mean, I feel really lucky because, you know, I can count, um, I mean, directors like Fosse and, and Bob Rafelson, um, you know, Sidney Pollock, Tony Richardson, Scorsese. I, I mean, I had the chance, Costa Gavras. I mean, just the best directors of that time mm -hmm. when movies, I mean, the best films, I think. I, I was lucky because, I mean, I, I came in right during the height of that kind of auteur yeah. movement in Hollywood. The studios were gone, basically, that whole studio way of approaching filmmaking. And now you had these artists who were making the best work of their lives. And I, I mean, I was so lucky because that doesn't really exist now. And I remember Sidney Pollack saying to me at one time, um, you know, the kind of films that we've made our, our lives doing, that's going to be over because the middle ground is about to be absorbed by, and that was at the beginning of what they used to call the big tent pole movies and the, mm. you know, the sequels and the um, uh, the, the franchises, the I franchises think, right, and right, right. all of that. And when you think of it, yeah, I mean, I just did a film in Ireland. We were making a film of Long Day's Journey and Tonight. Um, with the amazing cast and a great adaptation of, to me, the greatest American play, mm. um, but had so much trouble with the financing and it wasn't an expensive film to make. I mean, we were all working for nothing. It wasn't like mm. there were salaries to be paid, mm. but it just spoke to how difficult it is to make those kind of films nowadays. Mm. Whereas, you know, in the 70s, the 80s, I mean, Fosse could make a film like All That Jazz or Sidney could do Tootsie. And, you know, they had enough money in the budget and it was well done and people weren't scrimping and saving and, and they knew it was going to have a run in a theater. It wasn't going right. to go to fucking streaming and like all this bullshit. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> yeah, I don't like streaming. I've, I've got to ask you, you know, that, that, that one year when you were up for, was it, it was Best Leading Actress and Best Supporting Actress on the same Academy Awards, which probably many people in this room remember that ceremony. I do, and I remember that. I don't know what I want to ask, but I must have, it must have been, it must have been, what were you doing, like, hoping you got one over the other, because, or, or what, what that, or were people must have been jealous, I don't know, what was that like? I don't know, I mean, I, I, <laughs> it came out of the, I mean, yeah, it was, uh, it was good, it was, <laughs> I mean, it was fine. I, 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 yeah, it was the first time I'd really been recognized for my work as an yeah. actor. Yeah. You know, with Francis and Tootsie. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I was thrilled. And they were sort of different. I mean, the thing too yeah. is showcase. very different. Yeah. yeah. Was there a period of time when roles were coming at you so fast that you ended up not doing things that you wish you'd done? Yeah, a couple, but not many. But I could name like maybe three or. four. Two yes. or three, I won't mention them because <laughs> the actresses that played them were wonderful yeah. and why do that? Yeah. yeah. Um, but there were some I'm sorry I missed. However, my bigger regret is all the shit that I did. <laughs> 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 I would say, and I haven't done that many films. I've done like maybe 30 some films, 35, and I mean over a 45 year period of time. 45 um, years, right? Is it that long? Isn't it? Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, yeah. Something like that, yeah. 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 Um, but what I regret is, yeah, the ones that were just a waste of time. So and were you just not good at recognizing shit when it came your way? Is that the Yeah, I think partly, you know, because an actor, did, I mean, you know, you, you hadn't worked for a year or thing, and you're thinking, God, I should really, I should, I better work. Um, so you take something that you don't necessarily like or you're hopeful that you can, you, there's always that thing, you know, I think I can make something of this. I think <laughs> I can make this work. Um, but I would say over like the, of those 30 some films I've made, maybe a third of them have been good films and the rest are just, I don't know, for one reason or another, pure shite. And uh, and the couple that you what were the couple that you loved the most? Oh boy. Hmm. Well, I mean, all the the early ones, Francis Tootsie, um, Sweet Dreams, mm. uh, Music Box, um, <laughs> yeah, Cape Fear. I, I, um, God, I can't even remember any of my films. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, and then <clears throat> in, in like later, I found the most rewarding uh, work was in television. I, when I did Grey Gardens, mm. um, even, you know, the, the, about Joan Crawford and Betty Davis. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those, those th in later years, those were the most rewarding. Yeah. Okay. Even some of the characters that I did in um, American Horror Story, I really, yeah. And that's a whole, that's, that's a whole new generation of fans, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm amazed, yeah. So I flicked to another photo. What is that? Okay, so that, I mean, normally would have been a diner that was filled with people, and I, but I just thought it captured so um, that absence the, the, mm. of what, what the city was like then. I mean, so many places like that. Mm. Again. <laughs> Ironically, oh, yeah, not so open. Your choice of men and wi or women, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, no, those are amazing. On oh, those amazing photographs. Mm -hmm. 
there's another one in the book that we didn't show that is a sign it says uh, keep this far apart yeah yeah the old six foot rule that no, it, it's interesting. I was walking through the airport the other day, and I was there are remnants of these yeah. signs. They're like yeah. ghost signs now. Almost, I know it. Yeah, which is another whole other fascinating. Yes. Yeah. So, what's your next project? Um, right now, um, I've well, I just finished uh, filming that a long day's journey in tonight. So that's in the can now, is it? That is now finished. Um, we just wrapped in Ireland about two days ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, that's not an easy re Mary Tyro. I mean, oh. good lord. I mean, that's about the hardest character you could choose to play. Yes, but also just the greatest. I mean, I've this is the third time I've done it now. I did a production in London. I did a production in Broadway and now filmed it. And I mean, it's a testament to like the brilliance uh, and the, um, I mean, the truth that O'Neill was telling. You never come to the bottom of this character. You could play it for another 10 years and you would mm -hmm. still, mm -hmm. still be discovering aspects and elements of this character. She's, she's She's bottomless. It's just, yeah, it's, a, it's just the greatest, the greatest part ever, I think. And where will you take your camera next? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> None. <laughs> I have no project in mind. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, let us pause for a sec, and then we'll, folks are going to come around with a microphone or two, and if you have questions for Ms. Lang. Now, it, now, is the, now is the glorious moment. <laughs> yes, we can go ahead and get our Q&A session started. We have about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, in the interest of time, let's please keep things brief, state your name, and please ask a question, and we can leave the stories <laughs> to Ms. Lang and Mr. Jones up here, okay? <laughs> All right, yes, we'll start off right here. Um, hi, my name is Chase, um, and I was curious as to how like, your practice of derive has evolved since, since finishing that six month photography period? And if you still practice, and also like how maybe lessons you've learned during that have informed your life since? Um, well, yeah, I, I, I don't practice it regularly now because I haven't been in the city that much. Um, but for instance, today, because I flew into Chicago last night, and then didn't have to be here until this evening, I did start walking. <laughs> oh, wow, where did you go? You went <laughs> I walked for about five miles today oh. and uh, ended up going all the way down to the river, following the river, then going, saw a sign that said Navy Yard? Na Navy Pier? Navy, Navy Pier. Yeah. Um, so I wandered out there and mm -hmm. then came back and I yeah, I, um, so I still, I still love to wander. That, you know, it's that great Kierkegaard quote, uh, above all, do not lose your desire to walk. So I think of that all the time. I think about 400 people are going to, beginning tomorrow morning, going to leave their homes. <laughs> well, read, read, I mean, because I'm not a good, I, 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 don't, I haven't, um, explained it well, but if you look up Guy Debord and his theory of derive, it might inspire you to start wandering aimlessly. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Next question's over here. Okay. Just quickly before I ask my question, I have to tell you, I've loved you forever <laughs> since I was a teenager. <laughs> and when I sat through Sweet Dreams twice in the theater, I was hooked forever. I love oh, you so you. much. <laughs> and it's been a joy to share with my daughter, like watching AHS. And, but anyway, um, what gave you the courage when you were very young to just take off and go on these adventures? I, I have to tell you as a mother, I feel guilty because my daughter wanted to do that. She didn't want to go to college. And 
I said, you've got to go to college. You've got to go to college. And <laughs> feel like, but I so admire people like you and, and Bob Dylan, dare I say, <laughs> who just like take off and go and, and uh, because you have to do it when you're young. What That's gave a great you question. That courage a great to question. do that? <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I, I, I just knew running off to Europe with this group of guys was going to be a lot more interesting <laughs> than, <laughs> than the University of Minnesota. But um, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, it's the. the uh, I always think of like the, you know, the the last couple lines of of James Joyce, you know, the Ulysses, and that thing of, and I said yes, 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 and I think yeah, that's what we have to do because, I mean, now that I'm this age, I think, oh my God, if I hadn't said yes to everything that came my way, mm. um, yeah, my life would have. I would have never gone like the direction I did and be kind of swept away and taken places and done things. I'm, I, and I'm so grateful that I did, that I didn't hesitate, even, yeah, when maybe I should have, but I didn't. <laughs> so. Our next question will be back here. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Ms. Lang. My name is Jamie, a uh, longtime fan. Really appreciate you being here, and thank you for sharing another form of your art with us tonight. Um, my question is, uh, which came first, your interest in photography or what I'm assuming is a passion for acting? And then do you find that your work in front of the camera has influenced what draws you in as subject matter or um, as composition for your photography? Well. You know, I, I've, beside being like having the opportunity to work with such great directors, I've also worked with really great cinematographers. And mm. I, I, and it, it hasn't been like a conscious um, kind of, you know, learning experience, but I think having done films for as long as I have, I, I began to understand the power, uh, the emotional power of the frame and the lighting. And so I think the, the being on a set and you know, making films for all those years has also informed what I see when I look through a camera and what I'm drawn to. And it is, a lot of times, it's the emotional power of the light and what that elicits. I know just having shot um, Long Day's Journey and Tonight, you know, that thing of, of, I mean, they talk about the fog all the time, and, and you get a sense of the light and the fog and the weather and everything affecting the emotional lives of these characters, these, the, the people. And I have always found, you know, working with great cinematographers, their talent and their ability to zero in on that and inform the scene that the actor is playing in. And in some way, I think I've like drawn from that in my own photography and how I'm drawn to like framing something or the light, you know, brings me to it. Oh, I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> Probably yeah. not. But <laughs> I think you did. Did you ever walk behind the camera and look and see, see what the cinematographer was doing and seeing? Yes, back when, when we didn't have playback, which really dates me, but mm. um, <laughs> you would actually step behind camera, maybe even look through the lens to see how it's framed. And mm -hmm. we, uh, now, of course, nobody... I remember working with Tony Richardson, the great English director, and he would have... This, these, this was the time where like, the director was like standing right next to the camera, and he was watching you like this. You know, he wasn't in like video land over there. <laughs> and, uh, um, 
And there was a great synergy, there was a great exchange of energy, knowing that like not only the camera was watching you, but the director was an extension of it. And there was, I, I just found that, I don't know, very exciting in a way. Now, of course, they're, they're looking at, uh, you know, playback mm. and designing the shots and everything from what they see on playback. But in the beginning, yeah, the only way you would know, what would you, you would step back behind the camera and ask the cinematographer if you could see what his frame was or whatever. Um, but yes, I mean, I love doing that. And I, and I love that thing of the camera and the cinematographer and the director all like kind of right there with you. You know, there was a great exchange yeah. uh, of energy. It was like so, uh, alchemy in a way. It like created something. It's one another way that personal connection has gone the way of the, you know, that now yeah. it's all, yeah, yeah. Question is in the back. Uh, hi, Ms. Link. Thank you so much for coming to Chicago and making our night. <laughs> um, seriously, um, but I, I uh, Feud was my favorite miniseries of all time, uh -huh. <laughs> and I you embodied Crawford like no other. <laughs> and I really wanted to get your feeling. What, what do you think of the woman? Was she a villain or a Hollywood victim, Miss <laughs> Lane? Can you please answer that for me and my friends? <laughs> Thank you so much. I have to know. <laughs> That's, great. That's great. You know, it's interesting because I, I, I mean, I grew up on old movies. Um, so <laughs> I watched a lot of, and Crawford was never somebody that I was really drawn to as an actor. Um, I mean, but when I, when Ryan called me about doing this, uh, I thought, Joan Crawford, I don't know anything about her. Or, I mean, I haven't even really, you know, I've been a, a fan all these years. So I started looking into her life and really learning about her and watching her film. And then I was just in awe of her. I mean, I thought, this woman, first of all, she was one of the all-time great survivors. <laughs> she was powerful. She was, I mean, she had a life force that was, and one of the things, and I don't know if you've, one of the things that I loved, and I'd study it over and over and over again, even though I didn't have any scenes like this uh, in, the, in the film, obviously, because this was when she was like just up from Texas in her early uh, 20s, maybe late teens. But to watch her dance was something, I mean, the abandon and the sensuality and the, I mean, just kind of, um, just in your face type of, I, I mean, energy and sexuality that she had. I thought, God damn, this woman is, she is unique. And I actually just fell in love with her doing that. <laughs> so no, I didn't see her as a victim. I mean, all women were victims of Hollywood during that period. But she had <laughs> such power and such personal strength I, I think she was just extraordinary. And also talent. She was really a talented actress. Our next question will be right over here. Hi. Uh, my question is pretty much, do you mind sharing some of your favorite experiences when you were a roommate with Grace Jones and Jerry Hall? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, that's a great question. I was. I was just wondering that myself. <laughs> okay, I just, this is a, we need a disclaimer here because this. We're this, off the record. It's this all myth private. has like been, I don't know where this started. Grace and I were great friends. I loved Grace. We like spent a lot of time together. We had a lot of fun. This is Believe in Paris. Paris. This was in Paris. Paris. Yeah. 
<laughs> we had a lot of fun together. We were great pals. We hung out. Um, Jerry Hall was never, I, I, I don't know how that got started. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, she was just, you know, I. I never I, what? What, what I, do you mean? I, 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 <laughs> well, I mean, I met her briefly through uh, a mutual friend, this wonderful artist by the name of Antonio. <laughs> and, um, but I never hung out with her, and I, I, I never got to know her. Uh, so th th that myth that Jerry Hall and Grace Jones and I were like living together in Paris or something, it, it, it's not true. But the I, Grace it, Jones part. The Grace Jones true. part is absolutely <laughs> true. The Jerry Hall part, Mrs. Murdoch, is not true. <laughs> Next question up front. Hi, Miss Lang, being with us tonight. When I was nine years old, which was in 1977, 45 years ago, <laughs> um, I saw a little movie called King Kong. And it was the first time I'd been in a, in a theater and it uh, began my kind of lifelong love of movies. Right? And, and I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about that film and that performance and parlaying that into the great dramatic career you had after that. This is your first film. Right? It was my first film. It was my first <laughs> actual audition. Um, I had been living in Paris with Grace Jones. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, at some point, I had been there studying mime with the great old master Etienne de Croux. And after a couple of years living in Paris, and uh, I thought, oh, what a, I can't make a, you know, I can't make money as a mime. What are you going to do? And I, I have to, I, I mean, it wasn't like, I mean, I had to get a job. So I thought, well, I better get back to New York. So I finally left Paris, uh, sadly, and moved back to New York City. I uh, was working as a waitress at the Lion's Head down in the village. And um, somebody, and I was, I was taking acting classes because I thought, okay, well, okay, I can mime. Maybe I should try acting. So I was taking acting classes in New York City and I was also, I went to see a modeling agent thinking, I don't know, maybe I could make some money modeling. Um, I never did, by the way, but, um, but she said, are, I, uh, are you interested in acting? And I said, yeah, and she said, well, we have, a, we got a call looking for, you know, young m models to go out and audition for a film. Would you want to do that? I thought, well, well sure. <laughs> I'll take a break from my waitressing job. And, like, <laughs> and um, so that's how it happened. And they flew me out to Los Angeles. I went to MGM, which was like kind of this fantasy come true, my favorite studio all the time I was growing up. I mean, watching MGM movies and uh, and so got to Los Angeles, went to MGM to do this audition, and they were absolutely not interested in me whatsoever, <laughs> at all, at all. I weighed about 20 pounds less than I do right now. I'd been living in Paris, going to the disco with Grace every night. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had shaved my eyebrows, um, <laughs> and I had a blonde afro, like, uh, Dietrich and Blonde Venus. <laughs> so I walked in and I mean everybody else in the audition room were these like real California babes. I mean <laughs> yeah. Tits and ass and, and, just, and I thought oh well I, I, this has been a mistake and they thought uh oh this is a mistake. <laughs> and that's how it, it but they, they the, the agent called and said, because they were just going to send me home. The agent called and said, okay, you've flown her out there. At least put her on film. Let her just read or something. So uh, 
you know, they gave me the pages, the sides, and I, it, it, I did this scene. Nobody was around, not the director, not the producer, not the casting director. No, I think the second AD was like <laughs> said role. And, um, but then, you know, he must have called somebody because then the AD came and then pretty soon the director showed up and they said, can you stay a little while long? Um, and that's how it happened, you know. Then the producer, Dino De Laurentiis, came and watched. And by the time I left Los Angeles, they had offered me this part. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. I'm working as a waitress in New York at the Lion's Head, living in a fifth floor walk up. Um, I'd never have enough money even for the subway. And now I'm going to be in like what at the time was one of the most expensive films ever made. <laughs> and that's, it wasn't how I imagined starting <laughs> at all. I really had this fantasy about, oh, I'll do off-Broadway and then I'll, <laughs> maybe I'll get a Broadway part then maybe I can audition for film. You know, I had this whole scenario in my... Uh, but it started this way. And your, then your life changed instantly when you instantly, <laughs> yeah. But what it, what it felt like was that my life was interrupted. What What do you mean? That I was living this really interesting life, mm. and then suddenly I'm making a movie. Um, it wasn't. Yeah. It, it. I know that sounds odd, but it mm. felt like. This had interrupted my life somehow. Well, now you've got it back. Right? Yeah, <laughs> doing nothing. <laughs> right. Our we next got a couple question more will be right here in the center. Right. Hi, Jessica Lake. My name is Sean. It's such an honor. I'm a little nervous. Uh, <laughs> apologies, because I adore you. I, like, I absolutely adore you. But I was wondering, though, if you could expand upon there's Loneliness and absence is something that you've mentioned a lot this evening, and it's also something that I feel like a lot of roles that, that you take on have a lot of emptiness and, and loneliness and, and absence to them. And I wondered how that related to the photography, and also if you could expand on that, as well as your time as a mime, whenever you talked about um, being a fly on the wall and going off and photographing. And I was wondering about if you'd thought about how all those things correlated. And if you could expand on that, I would appreciate it. And again, I, I love you. I'm sorry, I'm super nervous. I'm super nervous, I love you. <laughs> well, the, the loneliness is something I feel like I've lived with my whole life. Even as a child, I felt that kind of loneliness. Um, and during different times in my life, it has been, um, it's been alleviated somewhat, you know, like when my children were young and, you know, family and, and then other times where it's been just overwhelming. Uh, um, and I think that the, the loneliness has informed Obviously, you know, the parts that I'm drawn to. It also always, I think, informs my photography. Um, and I, uh, again, I, I feel like, now I've just spent two and a half months in Ireland. And being out in the country there and being in the city and being around people, I didn't feel the loneliness there. But there is something, I think, in this country that, that feeds loneliness and isolation and separateness uh, and, and that sense of absence and what, to me, it's like what has gone missing. So all those things, and like I said, to varying degrees, I've lived with that my whole life even as a child. 
and I've never been able to escape that. So I'm drawn to those. I'm drawn to those characters. I mean, for instance, Mary Tyrone. I actually went through the play once and counted how many times she says alone or lonely or lonesome. And it's, you know, it is, it, so when I play that, I, I, I don't have to imagine it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's like a fulfillment in a way as odd as that sounds, but um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question <laughs> either. <but laughs> Are we, uh, next question? Next question's over here. All right. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Chris. Uh, my Hi. name's Alex. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, I'm so excited for Long Day's Journey in tonight. I think it's one of the best plays ever written as well, and um, I will go to the theater to see it and not stream, I promise you. Uh, yes. Don't you worry. Um, speaking of ensembles, my favorite, one of my favorite ensemble casts uh, and performances is of yours is Cape Fear. I was wondering if you could talk about Cape Fear, working with Scorsese, working with Juliet Lewis, Nick Nolte, Robert De Niro, I mean, everyone in that is in, in, impeccable. It's one of my favorite movies. Could you just talk about that movie and that experience for me? I'd really appreciate it. Also, I have a VHS if you feel like signing something. Also what? He, he also, I have a VHS for you to uh, sign oh. if you feel like signing anything tonight. <laughs> well, working with Scorsese was one of the great treats. I, I, being around his energy and his love of film and filmmaking and actors was just always contagious. Uh, um, I loved working with him. Um, he is by far one of the greatest directors and one of my favorite directors. And it is that enthusiasm he has, this infectious energy about filmmaking. Then of course, I mean, working with De Niro, I've worked, I've had the, you know, the, the great opportunity to work with him on two occasions. And it's, I mean, he's just one of the all-time great actors. Um, it, it was, yeah, it was, um, it was a wonderful experience. And I thought everybody's work in it was incredible. I mean, especially Juliet, who j had just started, really, and yeah, did something yeah. so Amy. wonderful with her character. But it's one of my favorite films. Yeah, it really is. Did you think going in it was going to be that good? Well, going in, I mean, I knew working with Scorsese and De Niro was going to be something, mm. yeah, out of the ordinary, something quite um, unique. So, but I, I mean, you never know when you're, you're doing a film, you know the work that you do and you know the, you see the work that other, but you never know how a film is gonna come together. Right. You know, it's a mm -hmm. great mystery. You can, you can have the greatest confidence in something and then it all collapses. Or you can be, like with Tootsie, I, 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 mean, I couldn't believe what Sydney did with that, I thought, you know, when I did it, I mean, it wasn't like such a big deal, but somehow he just created this magical film. Yeah. yeah. So. Couple of last questions. Are we good? Okay, there we go. Unfortunately, this will be our last question oh, okay. for the evening. All right. In addition to Robert De Niro, would there be one or two other actors you've been very impressed by when you worked with them and really enjoyed being with them? And the other thing, will there be an autobiography in your future? <laughs> <laughs> well, other actors that I've loved working with, um, certainly Tommy Lee Jones. Um, mm -hmm. When we did Blue Sky together, uh, he... <laughs> <laughs> he's just a, a great actor to work with. Not the easiest person in the world to know or to, you know, but uh, working with him, I found, 
a, a, a great delight. Also with um, Ed Harris. Now we've just done our second film together. He played James Tyrone. Um, we did we did uh, the Patsy Cline. We did Sweet Dreams mm -hmm. together. And it's interesting because when I watched the film at the rough cut, the director's cut, and I, you know, watching, 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 and then Ed has that last scene, and I thought, God damn him. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> he's so brilliant, he's going to steal the whole film. <laughs> and I thought, so, I mean, yeah, Ed is one of my favorites. Um, who else? I mean, obviously, there are a lot of actors that I've worked with. Um, of course, I can't remember one of them right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, th this whole evening has been a bit like going out for dinner with Jessica Lang and having a drink with Jessica Lang. And I hope you're buoyed by the the really palpable affection that I can feel <laughs> really, really in this room for you and your work. And it's just a real honor to have had this evening with you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jessica Lang. Okay. Wow.